Today, our keynote speaker is Dr. Tracy White Whedon. Dr. Whedon's impassioned keynote, Literacy as a Human Right is Certain to be Inspiring. And without further ado, Dr. Whedon, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Lauren, and welcome everyone. It's such an honor to be here with you. And I want to acknowledge every educator out there. I enjoy referring to you as VIPs, very important professionals, particularly in the 21st century. And I truly believe and support and advocate for literacy as a human right, one of the most crucial human rights in the 21st century. And we'll talk more about why in just a moment. I have personally experienced how equity and literacy are intrinsically connected. Effectively, literacy liberates. And equity through literacy serve as those hands that surround that family tree, lift that family tree, and have a generational impact. And so I want to start with a question just a moment about your why for the work, but I do want to give you just a little background information about Nye House Education Center. We are a national nonprofit. As a matter of fact, during the pandemic, we've been able to reach as far as Hong Kong and Dubai. We believe in supporting families who are running into a wall when it comes to supporting their student who is struggling with reading. We are a nationally accredited organization to help prepare certified academic language therapists and practitioners to serve children who are dyslexic and adults as well. Speaking of adults, we have many adults struggling with functional illiteracy in our society. Some are dyslexic and we serve adults at night to ensure from 18 to 85 year olds, they learn to read for the first time. It's so rewarding to us to see how their lives change, how something we take for granted, like reading a menu and not having to order the special every time becomes so meaningful to our adult literacy students. And then of course, we believe in apprenticing teachers and leaders to become diagnostic and prescriptive in their practice through evidence-based practices, through certification pathways. And so it's an honor to speak to you from the perspective of having the privilege of literacy, paying that privilege forward on my watch and knowing that you're a part of this moment together because you want to pay that forward as well. And that you can either make key decisions, you can do the work and create proof points, or you can influence from the middle so that every child, regardless of zip code, regardless of country, regardless of student group they belong to, receive literacy as the currency of the 21st century. And that starts with knowing who we are. It starts with our own core values. It starts with what we will refuse to accept on our watch in terms of the low classism and racism of low expectations. The need to be resolved that on our watch Systems will change to support children so that they do not fall through the cracks, so that educators do not fall through the cracks. Educators need a literacy safety net so that they can succeed at this most important profession that is the mother of all other professions. Educators are truly VIPs. And so I want you to think about why you entered the profession. What are your core values and beliefs? What do you believe about children being able to learn to read? Because if they can read, they can lead. They can pursue their dreams. They can leverage their gifts to the highest level. And our world and society need more than ever children as change agents of the future. They are those arrows that we're preparing to send into the future to make a difference. I must say, you may have been equally challenged, but we have to take our power back from this pandemic. At the top of the pandemic, my team and I had to figure out how are we going to 
reinvent ourselves, to make sure we're serving educators well and continuing to grow. We had to switch our model from face-to-face to, face to virtual, including virtual coaching. And I coined the term, we're entering a COVID chrysalis. We are going to reinvent ourselves. And when we come out, we're going to be different. We're going to be better. We're going to be able to reach more people than ever before. And so I want to challenge you today to think about your COVID chrysalis. How are you reinventing education? How are you reinventing how teachers, leaders are positioned for success? How children are being served based on the evidence of what works and strategically abandoning what is not working and serving children well. I cannot emphasize enough, you know, we shifted from that agrarian age to an information age and a knowledge economy. It's high stakes for our children and for our communities because without literacy, we do not have a place at the table and we might end up on the menu. Children need literacy to become viable citizens, to manage their health, to be a part of the digital dynamic that's at work where they can work and live anywhere. Without that, we have put a ceiling on their potential and we have defined their value in a way that does not elevate our children the way they must be elevated in our society. We need to acknowledge as well, particularly in the United States, there are seismic demographic shifts that have occurred and continue to occur. We have children who come to school with a language they are loved in that might not be classroom English. They may have a dialect they are loved in. For example, I'm originally from Detroit and there was a dialect I was loved in. And when I go to my community, it empowers me to engage and interact. And so with an assets-based approach, we need to look at these demographic shifts, embrace them, and build upon the language currency, the literacy currency that children bring to the classroom, and then build upon it so that they can navigate the structure of the English language, that we systematically unpack that so that they know at every stage, all the way through to graduation, how to own the structure of the English language for themselves and leverage it for a lifetime. I want to point out that the canary in the mine, if you look at adult literacy, are the number of adults who fell through the cracks historically. It's never too late to learn to read. It's never too late to become fully literate. But we need to be very aware that that data tells us a big story that we cannot ignore and that should inform leadership moves for educators. And every educator is a leader. Teachers, please never say I'm just a teacher. You transform the family tree through literacy when you become knowledgeable about evidence-based practices. And so effectively by looking at adults, we can understand what's ahead for children. We continue going the same way we're going and that we cannot allow. Looking at low literacy, the Barbara Bush Foundation consigned Gallup to assess the economic gains of eradicating illiteracy nationally and regionally in our country. And this is a quote I lifted from that particular report and said, if all adults in our country were able to move up to the equivalent of just a sixth grade reading level, friends, the national benefit economically is estimated to be $2.2 trillion annually. That's an amazing amount of funding. And so effectively, when we create a literacy safety net so that no child falls through the cracks, we are recapturing funding and we are positioning this country to remain internationally competitive as goes 
literacy, so goes democracy in our country. Because when we can read, we can think critically, we can make decisions, we can shape change. This is about nation building for any country. There's an amazing demographer in Houston. His name is Dr. Stephen Kleinberg. And he wrote a book I highly recommend called The Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America. And this quote speaks very clearly to the need to ensure that we are addressing any student demographic as we change and become more diverse as a country. And it says, by 2050, all of America will look like Houston does today. It is a safe statement to make that if Houston's Latino and Black young people are unprepared to succeed in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is difficult, if not impossible, to envision a prosperous vision for Houston. And I believe most of you would agree you could put the name of your city into that space in lieu of Houston. So on your watch, how are you going to affect change by dealing with systems that are not supporting the right work and shifting to systems that do? And that's the lens I want to look at this work through in addition to human literacy as a human right. What are the systems changes that need to be put in place and that can be put in place to make a difference in your community? What if your city became the most literate city in the nation? What would the ripple effect be? You are that butterfly effect in your city, in your district. It has been such an honor to collaborate with the Reading League, with thought leaders like Dr. Louisa Motes, Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen, Dr. Maria Murray, people I have such high esteem for. And you may be aware there is a document called the Defining Guide. If you don't know about it, Google it. You can download it for free as an ebook or you can order one for yourself. But being at the table to help shape this definition was one of the most meaningful processes in my life and to be a part of this movement in, in partnership with the Reading League. And this quote says, the science of reading is a vast interdisciplinary body of scientific-based research about reading and issues related to reading and writing. This research has been conducted over the last five decades across the world, and it is derived from thousands of studies conducted in multiple languages. The science of reading has culminated in a preponderance of evidence to inform how proficient reading and writing, and I would add speaking, develop why some have difficulty, and how we can most effectively assess and teach and therefore improve student outcomes through prevention of and intervention for reading difficulties. Our work is about prevention, not just intervention. If we think of literacy as an ocean, where we can teach educators to help children navigate that and learn to swim, successfully. We don't have to wait for reading failure and then administer CPR with all of the damage that does to a child's psyche, social, emotionally, and their sense of efficacy. We can prevent, we can identify early what needs to be identified to serve children well. I think it's very important, again, with this idea an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. How do we do that work? How do we make that happen? Well, one of the aspects of prevention is also early identification. This research that was conducted by, uh, for the state of California by the Boston Consulting Group puts it in stark dollars. Neglecting dyslexic learning has a huge financial cost to society. Dyslexia will cost the state of California 12 billion this year. Think about that year upon year upon year. And we're talking about dollars, but we also need to think about long-term effects of children 
who are not served well and identified early when it comes to being dyslexic. I hope this really captures that fire in your belly and makes it burn bright because when we look at the United States of America, we have the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. And there's a clear through line between literacy and liberty. Now, there are people who just do terrible things and they need to pay the price for what they did. However, let's think about it. If you're illiterate and you're trying to function in society and you have very limited options, it's so easy to become desperate and make ill-informed decisions that end up leading to the school to prison pipeline. This is the high stakes aspect of our work. When we look at different states, I want you to identify your state if you see it at the top of this list. And as you can see, the, the, the large states like Texas, California, Florida are at the top of the list. There's good work going on in some of those states, but the sense of urgency to ensure that there is alignment in terms of legislation at the national level, state level, and district level is absolutely imperative. Recently, I had the chance to present the first science of reading based um, conference in New Mexico. And um, Dr. Timothy Odegaard, if you don't know his work, you need to know his work. He, he positioned NAEP in a really powerful way. And he, he influenced me in terms of how I look at this data. If you think about NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, and how are we serving all students? Are we serving them well? It is so interesting to look at a critical mass of students at below basic, 33%, at basic, 31%. When you put those percentages together, that's 64% of our students who are low proficient. Again, let's emphasize, this is a knowledge economy in an information age. Don't we want children at least proficient and even at advanced levels? fastest improving systems that we get to work with as a nonprofit, they're having a conversation about not just proficiency, but moving as many children to advanced as possible so that they're literate for a lifetime. Only 26% proficient and 9% advanced. We can do better. If we think about children with disabilities, once again, we see a opportunity gap that is seismic with a combined percentage of 89% of children who are below basic or at basic and very few at the proficient and advanced level. Here's the other one I want to talk about, and that is the common denominator, poverty. I will never forget my friend, Dr. Julie Washington at the International Dyslexia Association Conference saying, dyslexia is not a gift if you're poor because you can't afford therapy. If I have to choose between gas, groceries, and therapy as a parent, we've got to survive. And so part of that literacy safety net is addressing the children who are who have an identified disability or who are navigating the war zone of poverty, having the most high quality instruction, regardless of their zip code. When we look at the children who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, these children, 78% combined percentage look similar to children with disabilities. Same thing with children who happen to be the student groups of being black and Hispanic. So is it a problem with dyslexia or dystichia? Teachers deserve to be apprenticed, to be diagnostic and prescriptive in their practice so they win at this battle against illiteracy. Leaders deserve to have the right information to make informed decisions that will be sustainable in a system, not stop, start, stop, start. And that's what our work is about as a nonprofit. How do we support sustainable practices that serve our children and educators well? I decided to pull the NAEP scores for Pennsylvania because I want to show what is a typical trajectory when you look longitudinally at NAEP scores, and that is flatline, flatline for students. 
even a dip, whether the demographic is white, black, or Hispanic, below the proficiency bar, with the exception of a few states like Mississippi, making very bold moves to change the conversation. With children with disabilities, without disabilities, again, a decrease. And think about the COVID effect. This is the moment for a dramatic pivot and resolve to change systems in ways that will support children for a lifetime when they become adults. Again, children who are eligible or not eligible for free and reduced lunch, we see a dip. And on our watch, I know that is unacceptable. So let's be frank. Collectively, we are unraveling things that we inherited, the bitter fruit that we're still chewing on that go back to the days of anti-literacy laws in the 1830s, when it was illegal for a white person to teach black people to read. Now it's about having the will for the work, understanding that classism and racism are underscored when we do not change systems to support right work. Goes back to times when there was a literacy test, when, when people who wanted to vote couldn't vote if they couldn't pass a literacy test. And it's so interesting when we think about the dynamic that very state that is now showing progress because they made a bold pivot used to have that dynamic at work where voter registration was tied to literacy. So we don't have to stay in that historic darkness. We can come to the light if we have a vision that's big and bold enough to pursue. We have a dynamic of recidivism that we must acknowledge. Recidivism decreases significantly when an inmate learns to read and often parole is tied to the ability to pass a GED. Well, if I'm dyslexic and I'm not being served, I can't pass it. 85% of adjudicated youth who are at the cusp of the school to prison pipeline are functionally illiterate. 60% of prison inmates are functionally illiterate. And the First Step Act was the, the right step to take to try to overcome this dynamic for inmates who are dyslexic who never received services but it's not enough. We've gotta be bolder. We've gotta build upon that legislation and check your state to see how that's going along. Is that happening? Are inmates being identified and served? A life sentence and intervention deeply influences the likelihood of a lifetime in prison. I will never forget a day when I went to a maximum security prison in Texas, Livingston, Texas, and spent the day with a dear educator of mine who worked with inmates there, and they adore her to this day. They call her mama sometimes or Miss Betty at other times. And a dear friend of mine, Dr. Clammy, Tammy Clementi, and I spent the day with 60 of those inmates. She called them her men, her, her guys. And in two groups of 30, we interviewed them and we talked to them about their backstories. It looked just like Nate. Either they were warehoused in special education classrooms and never learned to read, dyslexic and unidentified, navigating the war zone of poverty, consistent through line with the data I just showed you. So on your watch, how will that change? It has to change because I will always at my heart be a classroom teacher and a recovering English language arts teacher. I started my journey in inner city Detroit in a high poverty high school. And my children sometimes struggling in my theater arts program would struggle with the script because they were so engaged in that area, but they were struggling with reader, reading. And now I know they were dyslexic, some of them. And I wasn't equipped to even begin to recognize that. And I was saying things like try harder. Well, if you look at the dyslexic brain, it's trying five times as hard. So that was not the message they needed. They needed me to be apprenticed. And in my pre-service teacher preparation program, I did not hear the word dyslexia once when the science was already available. 
That's unacceptable. So on your watch, engage universities. And there are a small group who are reinventing teacher preparation programs, but we need the critical mass of universities to retool, reboot, and reinvent how we prepare not just teachers, but leaders for the right work. Because I ended up leading in the seventh largest district in the country, the Houston Independent School District, and I didn't know what I didn't know as an assistant superintendent. That's unacceptable. My master's and my doctoral program should have prepared me to know how to scale this work responsibly. It's the most important thing we're going to do because we know literacy is the mother of all other content areas. We can't leave that to chance for superintendents, for curriculum instruction leaders, for SPED teachers, for SPED leaders. So that has to change. I really love this quote and identify with it deeply. The most dangerous phrase in the language is, we've always done it that way. My question is, what would we change that we can control? On your watch, what will you change that you can control? Because it's not magic. Cartoon says, what if we don't change at all and something magical happens? We've been waiting for something magical happen, to happen for too many decades. And the children, to quote one of my favorite superintendents, Dr. Art Kavassler says, the little people are waiting for the big people to get it together. And we can. There's a moral imperative. It is ethical that we get reading right the first time for every child and we intervene intensively for those who need more support. I'm so proud to say across the nation, our nonprofit works with districts that are identifying the right work and doing it with that shoulder partner. You shouldn't do this work alone in a silo. And I call these our lighthouse state departments, our lighthouse districts, our lighthouse schools, and our lighthouse classrooms. And inevitably, when the strategy is employed where we bring others who want to do the right thing to see this work in action, they have a mental model from which to backload about how to make this work scalable and sustainable on their watch. There's even a district that we've worked with for 22 years, Brownsville ISD, where through a grassroots effort led by Dr. Elsa Cardenas Hagen, they actually put that evidence-based practices would be the forward trajectory for the district 22 years ago. It's in board policy. That's serious focused effort about the right work. Again, it's not just about doing work, it's about doing the right work. So when we think about the right work, we need to think about those windows of opportunity that include that pre-K through first grade prevention focus, universal screening. Do you have quite high quality tier one instruction going on? When I worked nationally in the past for Scholastic, uh, Scholastic Achievement Partners, from Compton USD to DC Public Schools, I found districts are trying to intervene themselves out of poor first instruction. We've got to get first instruction right. And so when we do that, we have fewer negative consequences. We have less early reading failure. At the first job, Dr. Nadine Gabb says that children have their first job is learning to read. We can't fail them. It's much more cost effective. In our districts we work with, they are able to recapture funding they've been spending on intervention services for enrichment for all, particularly for children who come from poverty, who may have a different cultural collateral than those who come from higher SES families. And then second and third grade, we want to diagnose and treat and ensure that we continue assessing, evaluating, making mid-course adjustments. We wanna make sure special ed is aligned and that for dyslexic students, the intensive intervention is in place for them. So it's a seamless conveyor belt of support for children at every level, at every stage, at every age. So when we think about diagnosis and treatment, we wanna overcome those negative consequences of delayed reading success and less effective cost measures. Also, I want to think about this work through research from the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research. We cannot 
leave one stone uncovered. And that also means bringing strategic partners to the table to help us think about the work holistically, how to address the needs of the whole child. So if you have wrapped your arms around the multi-tiered system of support, it's socially emotional and it's the instruction, right? We need effective leaders who know how to do the right work, implementing with a clear vision. We need collaborative teachers who are working with the same resolve at the right work. We need family engagement. We need to involve our families so that they're reinforcing evidence-based practices from home. We need to ensure we have a supportive environment. And you know, anecdotally, I can't explain this why. We find when we do this work right in schools, teacher retention gets higher, it improves. And the, the, the environment becomes more intentional and focused. And I think it's because everybody's winning. Literacy and culture are intrinsically tied to one another. And that we want ambitious instruction, but it needs to be applicable to the science that is proven. I highly recommend when you think about family engagement and your future planning that you think about the work of Dr. Karen Knapp. Her dual capacity framework is brilliant. There's a new version so that again, we can be intentional once we get our systems in place at pulling that family into the table and wrapping our arms around the entire family unit. And there are some systems so bold as to offer adult literacy services to families because a literate adult can apprentice a more literate student. This may look familiar to some of you out there. I felt that way many times as a teacher, as a campus leader, and as a district leader. I call this the classic initiative overload photo. It's when everything's a priority and everything cannot be a priority. It's when mixed messages, blurred messages end up hitting campuses. Principals don't know who to listen to next. Special education has a priority. Curriculum and instruction have a priority, et cetera, et cetera. And so what's at risk is abandoned ship. I'll leave the profession or I'll cross my arms and wait till this too shall pass because it's just another initiative and they'll get tired of it eventually. If you succeed, you most likely will let go of your original strategy that is not working. That's part of what we have to do. Are you prepared to be vulnerable, to admit what didn't work and to strategically abandon it, to replace it with the right work when it comes to building a literacy safety net. I really appreciate this quote from Dr. Steve Dykstra, and it says, you don't need to know the science of reading to follow the curriculum. You need to know the science of reading because sometimes following the curriculum isn't enough. And that is, if the curriculum is not aligned, evidence-based practices. So if you happen to have a curriculum that is non-structured in its approach, You've got to use a supplemental curriculum. And there are wonderful providers, Nyhouse Education Center being one of them, that provides supplemental curriculum to fill those gaps in your literacy safety net. But you can't give kids expired services. My daughter cracks me up because my eyesight is not that great. And sometimes there's something expired and I pull it out and she said, mom, the expiration date is Look at this, mom. It's got mold all over it. We can't eat this. And we can't give our children things that are expired either. We've got to be strategic about what we can actually perhaps leverage, but then fill those gaps and give children the best, the best nourishment that they become fully literate. I want to emphasize another dynamic I see nas uh, nationally, and that is the silo effect. And this comic says, our silo mentality may be getting out of hand. And that's when people are protecting their turf. And they're forgetting that if we're working in silos, we're not working smarter, we're working harder. This work is about strategy. This is chess, not checkers. And so when we think about working strategically, we need to bring key stakeholders to the table when we're planning the work and then we're working the plan. 
So what do we have control over? Wherever you live in the world, you have control over three variables. If you want children to be able to read in the language of power, write in the language of power and express their ideas in the language of power, you have control over time, talent, and funding. How are you leveraging those three variables on your watch? Mapping those resources for literacy and strategically abandoning what's not working prepares the soil for the seeds you will plant to grow a harvest of the literacy success in your district. And we love to consult with districts, bring that cabinet in, unsiloed, vulnerable conversations, looking at that data at all tiers and aligning all of the arrows in the same direction so that time is leveraged wisely, talent is prepared for the right work, many districts galvanizing literacy coaches who will lean into the work as a shoulder partner with leaders and teachers to calibrate for the right work, and then the funding. And again, ultimately recapturing funding I used to work with districts before I, I became president of Nyhouse Education Center. And we look at the cumulative funding loss for children who gave up and dropped out in high school. You would be astonished at multiple millions of dollars, title funds, walking out of the district when children give up. And so effectively you recapture those funds as well. I'm so proud of this particular partnership because it continues. And this superintendent I referenced earlier, Dr. Arturo Cavazos, was superintendent and now works with superintendents in Texas to help them scale the work of literacy responsibly. His approach was to do what I referenced. He created a design team that was unsiloed so they could plan the work to quote him, work the plan, stay true to the work of early literacy, prepare the system for change, remove the barriers, have a bold kickoff with strategic communication, making it clear to stakeholders, what are we gonna stop doing? What are we going to start doing? And then beginning that implementation coaching, building those coaches up so that they could support the right work. Because as a nonprofit, our goal is to work with those who are ready to benefit from sustainable systems of support so that we can point to you as a lighthouse district or system and go on to the next system to help more people. So they lived up to and honored that agreement completely. And I wanna show you through the uh, Texas Public Information Resource Report, where they started in 2014, where they were significantly below the state in their performance, a negative 12.4%. And what happened through multi-year, multi-phase work? You see that there was dynamic growth over time, healthy growth, then more and more momentum building until the point that now Harland is outperforming the state. And this is in the Valley, where the critical mass of the children and the language they're loved in is Spanish at home. They're seeing this shift into advanced levels of performance. And so this can be done. They are a lighthouse in Texas. We should also see over time, as we see in their data, their ICIP data, that when they extracted their data, they're seeing a decrease in the critical mass of children who are at tier three. That is what we want to see over time for these great levels. And the beauty of this is we align special education in their district to the science of reading research. We align dyslexia. And so the children that they're identifying are the children who need that intensive support. For the sake of time, I'm going to keep moving on, except to reference here, just note the stair-step effect at each grade level where we see that strategic growth supported over time. Let's dig more into this idea of a literacy safety net and why it's so important. We cannot ignore that there are barriers to learning that go beyond strong first instruction in classrooms. There needs to be a way in your system that you organize the work around other barriers to learning. 
And I absolutely have such respect for the work of Edelman and Taylor. And this work focuses on looking at a problem of practice, as you see, leadership for learning supports in the middle. In this case, let's put literacy center in the middle. What needs to do, what needs to happen in your space to change that trajectory for students? Well, number one, we definitely want classroom-based approaches to enable learning aligned to the science, aligned to evidence-based practices, structured literacy instruction. So we can put that in place. We can control for that. However, there may be areas where you need partnerships. The, 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 the nonprofits in your um, community, other folks who are aligned to your focus on literacy, but who would address other barriers. For example, barriers such as student family interventions, whether they be academic or social emotional. What about family engagement? How can you engage those families so that your school system is invitational at all levels? The parents are treated as honored partners in this process. There are research-based practices like the work of Dr. Karen Mapp that can be incorporated. Community engagement. Members of your business community understand you're sounding the alarm that we have a literacy crisis in our community, in our country. And what about foundations who want to support the right work? Engage them, tell your story, bring them to the table because they can provide supplemental resources that create an equitable opportunity for every child. This is the moment where when corporations and foundations are really leaning into this movement. Crisis assistance and prevention. I'm going to tell you this quick story. When I was working as that high school English teacher and theater arts teacher, there was a day when we were about to present a play. We were going through our dress rehearsal. We were preparing to. And you saw that picture a few slides before. It was for... Um, El Haj Malik, The Life of Malcolm X. We were producing that as a musical. Actually identified Malcolm X's brother and he came and visited with my students to talk about his brother. It was just amazing. Well, we were preparing to go into that dress rehearsal space. There was a Dairy Queen next to McKenzie High School. And that Dairy Queen was where the kids would go and snack before we would go into practice mode. And one of the young men who was actually leading a group of dancers who agreed to be modern dancers in my play. And these were some of the kids, others would have said, you're, you're, you're a thug, you, you would never do this. An amazingly talented young man brought other young men to the table and they, they did this beautiful modern dance for the play as part of our work. Terrence was sitting on a park bench and a young man in a case of mistaken identity walked behind Terrence, took out a gun and shot him in the back. Terrence got up, ran across the street and collapsed on the curb. The next thing I know, my students are rushing into my studio, weeping and saying, Miss White, Terrence has been shot and it doesn't look like he's going to make it. The thing that broke my heart the most was that they could look at Terrence and had seen enough street violence that they called it right. He did not survive. I did not have a crisis intervention team. It was me and my children in my room reframing that moment, dedicating the play to Terrence and determining we couldn't stop. We had to keep going and we did it. We did it together, but there was no way that I should have had to handle that crisis alone. Teachers need the support to address all of those barriers beyond strong classroom instruction and know exactly who to call on for what and when. We also need to support the transitions that can be very tenuous for children between elementary and middle school or junior high between middle or junior high school and high school so that we hold those children close to us and we don't let them go. 
and we provide those bridges, which external supporters can help us with. So with that, when we think about navigating the war zone of poverty, common enemy sucks the life out of the mind, body, and spirit of people. We can work so much smarter. And this research out of the Brookings Institute is so powerful in that it points out on the y-axis, if you look at poverty versus moderate or high income, and you look at it by family, whether they are white, black, Hispanic, mother with a less than a high school education, mother with a high school education. If you're poor, you're less likely to have a student coming to school kinder ready. I want you to know something that is so profoundly powerful. Think about on your watch, the young women that you're educating, they found the greatest differentiator was a mother with a bachelor's degree or a higher degree. Those children are much more likely to come to school kinder ready. And I would love to do some research on this to see, is it literacy that's the currency that's being transferred? I would bet you anything that that's it. Marriage didn't make as much of a difference, not being married. And the preschool, this is another area where we can provide attention. The preschools that are feeding into your district, they align to the science. They align to evidence-based practices. If not, this is a partnership opportunity. This is a part of working smarter and not just harder at this work. If you don't know the work of Dr. Julie Washington, you must. You must be introduced to her. She is one of my researcher heroes. And she said something so profound on a, uh, a call we were on one day. I said, I want to consider this an interview and quote you. May I? She said, absolutely. She's a straight shooter. And she said, we should not allow the prestige of the dialect impact our views of the people who speak them. How can we decide not to respect the scholar because we do not respect the dialect? And I agree. I don't care if you're white, black, or polka dot. I don't care if you live in Appalachia, if you live in the Valley in Texas, or if you live in California or the East Coast, doesn't matter to me. Children are precious treasures. And we can wrap our arms around all of them, regardless of the dialect that they're loved in, the language they're loved in, or the language variety, as Dr. Washington says. The science is agnostic of dialect, but we can certainly build upon the currency that the child brings that they need to navigate their neighborhood, their home life. We can honor it. And again, universities can position teachers to know how to conceptualize literacy in a way that honors that, respects that dialect is also rule-based and build upon it. Dr. Washington also said in this, um, actually with Dr. Seidenberg in this particular article from the American Federation of Teachers, reading depends on spoken language. So we can't ignore that particularly for our English language learners. For most children, the language they bring to school will support learning to read. Some children's language skills differ in important ways from the classroom language variety. And teachers rarely receive guidance on how to enhance literacy instruction to meet these children's needs. And here's the thing, that's the next. We've been tinkering at the edges for too long. We know how to get core instruction and intervention right based on the science. Now we should be going deeper into those language varieties to be strategic and build the body of implementation science where that is concerned. We've got to accelerate, friends. We've got to accelerate. The reason the amazing teachers who want to win at this work. We are fighting this battle for every one of them. Every one of those who have now just about given up on the profession. Those have, who have made an exit, but who could be recaptured to come back because this work brings honor to our profession that is deserved by educators.
It is also deserved by instructional leaders who need to understand how to focus on learning that actually impacts teaching. Leaders who believe it is their fundamental task to evaluate effect in the system on everyone in their school, leading to strong student outcomes. Leaders who believe that success and failure in student learning is about what they as teachers and leaders did or didn't do, who see themselves as change agents. It's not just about being aspirational, it's about being effective, who see assessment as feedback on their impact and who are vulnerable when they don't know how to change the impact and go to people who do. It's about leaders who understand the importance of dialogue and of listening to student and teacher voices. It's about leaders who set challenging targets for themselves and for teachers to maximize student outcomes. Again, it's not just about proficiency, it should be about advanced performance. Because if we're reaching that high, we're going to surpass proficiency over time. It's about welcoming that there are errors and saying, you know, that's fascinating. Look at what we discovered. This is an error. How do we address it? How do we control what we can? And sharing what they've learned and being transparent and vulnerable about their own errors. That creates an environment that supports teachers and students in learning forward. And, you know, we can fail forward. That's how we learn, which is culture. And doing that without losing face. This is another crucial part of the picture. I really want you to lean into this. And this is the work of Joyce and Showers. And when I reached out to um, the two doctors, I got this feedback. In principle, it applies to leaders and literacy coaches as well. So I don't know how much as a learning um, leader, how many professional development opportunities I was exposed to where I just got the theory and I was so excited and I would go back to my classroom and I had an implementation gap. I didn't know how to pivot to application. And as you can see, well, we can grow the knowledge of a teacher, 10%, skill implementation, 5%. Look at the transfer to classroom application. So are we working strategically with funding if we don't have a plan for that so that it shifts to application? We're not working smarter yet, but we can. What if we add theory, a practice theory, one of those pop-ups just distracted me, I'm sorry, plus demonstration. We do see an increase in teacher knowledge and understanding of the concept and growth in terms of skill implementation. However, goose egg when it comes to classroom application. Well, what if you have an expert providing practice for the participants? A seismic shift in knowledge and skill implementation. Is this enough for you on your watch? 5% classroom application. This is the shift that we need. And that is when we add coaching and support to teachers. That's when we're really shifting to apprenticing teachers and leaders in those practices. And we see a dramatic shift, which explains the data for Harland and CISD when they invested in coaching and we didn't wanna be there forever. The idea was to build that capacity and sustain that change over time so that classroom application soars and is consistent. I want to add this anecdotally for Harlingen. When they started to see that dramatic shift to the 90s, they did see a couple of campuses that dropped off of the radar when they had invested in early literacy training for their pre-K teachers. So when they dug into the data, they found those campuses and they went to those campuses to speak with the principals. And I bet you can guess what they found. The principals had taken those teachers who were highly trained and skilled and put them into the tested grade. You see, they had forgotten the why. They had missed the boat. The idea is prevention, not just intervention. It's not the tail wagging the, the dog of the state test. It's about growth and formative assessment leading to that kind of growth. You know, I think about my ancestors who gave their lives 
who went through such trauma so that I could be in a space like this today. And I take that very seriously. And I want you to think about the shoulders you stand on today. Who were those aspirational adults, whether they were a teacher, a parent, a pastor, a colleague? Maybe it was an experience that hurt you so deeply to your core that you said, on my watch, this will never happen to a child. And my son is one of those who's now a certified teacher who had a very traumatic experience in kindergarten. I didn't find out about until he was an adult. What is your why? And whatever that is, let that be the anchor of your soul because this is hard work. You will run into opposition. But it is so much easier to build strong children than repair broken men and women. I believe what Dr. Kleinberg said, the source of wealth for any community in the 21st century will have to do with attracting the best and brightest people working on the cutting edge of knowledge in a knowledge economy. The resource of the knowledge economy is housed between the ears of the best and brightest people in America and any country who can live anywhere. And now because of the pandemic, they can work almost anywhere. In the words of Dr. Nelson Mandela, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Because often fear is false evidence appearing real. We can run towards those Goliaths and we can take them down if we have a vision that's big, bold, fervent, and focused enough on your watch, you can see dramatic change. Let's be people who walk by faith. Let's have that vision where we can see what we can only describe with words, but those words are the hands that will shape the future. Let's be those focused adults intervening tenaciously with hope. Hope that is actionable. Hope that has a strategy. Hope that is strategic. Hope that will have a generational impact. You will and should expect opposition because the energy vampires there want to distract you from doing the right work. Give your energy to the believers, the people that Dr. Anthony Mohammed talks about, who all you have to do is remove the barriers like Dr. Cavazos did. The tweeners, when they see the success, as you highlight the believer's success, will make that shift and you'll build that critical mass of believers. You make it very difficult for the energy, energy vampires to suck the life out of the system. It is not about us, it is about our children. It is not about some philosophy, it is about what is proven. We at Nye House Education Center are here to support you on that journey. I wish you great success as you experience, this, experience those successes, celebrate, take the time to celebrate every milestone, every moment, share them with me because I need energy. I need gas in my gas tank too. And we are going to see on our watch transformational change that will have a generational impact. Again, thank you for the honor of participating and joining this amazing conference today. Thank you so much, Dr. Whedon. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to, I know as you were presenting, you probably didn't see the phenomenal comments that have been entered into the chat. You might want to peruse those because it, they're going to make you feel really good, I'm sure. Um, everyone is just so thankful for you um, sharing and being so uh, vulnerable. And um, I mean, uh, you're a, a beacon. You are a beacon and bringing me to tears. I love all of these comments. So you're you're just going to feel really good about yourself when you read this, oh, but gosh. yes, um, we thank you so much. Um, and I just, I plucked out some of the words because there's a lot in the chat, but um, we thank you for being compelling, passionate, inspiring, empowering. Uh, we thank everyone who attended today.